So talking about vision and how we're going to get there, no pressure. <laughs> I'd like to, to take this time to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Mr. Or excuse me, Dr. David Bentecourt. You know, I, I had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Bentecourt on the phone several times uh, before, before meeting him this morning, and his, and his wife is here as well, joining us. Welcome. Um, I was inspired in talking with him. He has such incredible knowledge for, for how to be lifelong learners, which I think all of us strive to be. His humor is second to none. Um, I think we, we got off track for maybe about 20 minutes before Paul roped us back in to get back to business. Uh, but just a phenomenal person. Um, has an incredible message to share with us. So let me just read a quick bio here for Dr. Benecourt. Professor Benecourt is a strong advocate for the expansive educational movement, experimental learning models, service learning, and habits of minds initiatives, and growth mindset. And then overarching teaching philosophy that incorporates learning dispositions as a central as central to the educational experience. With that, help me welcome Dr. David Benecourt. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm good looking. I'm using my teaching voice. Can you hear me OK? That, I know some of you are impressed. How did he do that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on today. So I think my wife would disagree with the whole humor thing. Um, you know, I joke with her all the time. And, Pretty much I get this. <laughs> she says, I'll be in bed upstairs. <laughs> All right, so um, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about me. Besides what I, I do, I'm really fortunate to come out and travel and, and, and just help colleagues all the time and, and travel internationally helping teachers, just helping teachers mostly. That's where my focus is. But um, I'm a family man first. Those are my kids up there. I actually live fairly local about... Um, well, in Norco, so depending on traffic, you know, 30 minutes to three hours, just depends. <laughs> um, and I, I love my family. My career actually started uh, as a band director, right? And so, yeah, those two don't seem to mix, right? Like, but you're saying he's smart, but he's a band director, so. <laughs> um, and I still actually do that a lot. I, I'm really fortunate I sort of have a dual career thing. So that's sort of uh, who I am career-wise. I'm also a first generation, like uh, our, our, your Chancellor Bruce had mentioned, I'm a first generation college student. And so, well, what does that mean? You know, the definition of a first generation means that neither of your parents uh, went to college. Okay, so I didn't have that help with getting into college, except any help that I got with the counselors or the teachers or anybody who was at the high school where I was at, right? Didn't, like, my parents didn't say, well, when I went to college, this is how I, you know, or, you know, don't forget to grab these deadlines, or don't, none of that was put in front of me. So I still, to this day, look back and marvel and realize how many people helped me. I don't even know all of them who they were, because they were doing it behind the scenes. But, oh, sorry, I, I got distracted by the pom-poms. <laughs> so do me a favor, if you like something a lot, just, like, shake your head. Oh, that's good, okay, cool. All right, so first generation, I'll try to stay on topic, sorry. Now, 50%, and actually this is an old, uh, uh, somewhat of an old stat, but you know, 50% of our students in community colleges are first generation students. 50% of, and your chancellor said, here it's 55%. So 55% of your students are first generation. So they didn't receive that support at home. They had to have gotten it somewhere else. Now, even if they did receive it at home, right, best of parents, but the parents didn't have the experience, so they would have had to learn along the way as well, or been really proactive about it, right? That's a biggie. Now, I want to get a little scientific here with you, because um, you know, some of you, like that number doesn't mean a whole lot. So here's my first chart. <laughs> Let's say this is your entire student population here, okay, at Valley College. I want you to notice the care I took in picking this piece, because if you look at the slices, they're very diverse. All right, you've got a very diverse population here, right? But for you, 55% of them 
or first generation. Fit, that looks kind of like this. Okay, so now you're, yeah. Wow, I wowed you to silence. I thought you would actually laugh at that, but I know it's because it's not 55. Some of you are going, that's not, fi that's not 55%, that's 50. <laughs> I got it, I understand, okay? I didn't know until 30 minutes ago, all right? What's the impact of that? Here's some good hard facts here. Here's the impact. If neither of your parents went to college, this is where you would end up in terms of, would you go to college? If they didn't get a bachelor's or anything else, what's the probability that you're going to get a bachelor's as their son or daughter? 12% with no high school diploma there, right? High school graduate, 17.3. Let's go all the way to the end here. An earned bachelor or advanced degree. That's, those are significant numbers, yeah? For me, I was actually down at the very bottom, because my parents actually didn't go to even high school, and, they, uh, and my grandparents didn't go. I mean, I really was like, I don't know what you would call that, hardcore first generation? I don't know. <laughs> Something. I mean, but it was hardcore, okay? Here's the other thing that we know, and, I've, and if you've been teaching in a community college for even one semester, you know this already, even anecdotally. They come underprepared, right? It's huge for us at the community college level. Even at the four-year schools now, they're having this issue. They come underprepared to the college. Why? Well, there's a, there's a number of reasons. I mean, the 50% status, uh, part of that, where they're not getting the support at home, they're not able to get the support that they want at home. But there's also the way the system is built. That's something we can't really fix, at least out of this line. Because even if they're getting help from their counselors and the teachers and everybody in the K through 12, and let's just assume they are. Let's, let's say they're getting all the help. In fact, a lot of them are able to get here because they get that help. But the fact of the matter is that for the last 12 year, uh, years, school years of their life, they have been handed everything, okay? And we don't think about that too much. They don't think about it at all unless somebody tells them. But they have spent, just spent 12 years, even your valedictorian has spent 12 years being the best at, at doing what they're told to do, right? That's what they do. And then they come to college and what happens? They're not told anymore and yet they have more resources than they've ever had before. This is a conversation I have, I, I still teach, by the way, uh, full time, and I have this conversation with as many students as possible, just to let them know that fundamental difference. Look, if you want to succeed here, the first thing I want you to realize is that you are now in the driving seat. We have financial aid, we have all these things, we have more resources than you've ever had before, but you have to go and get it. You have to be, and then, of course, how? I mean, that's a, whole, that's a whole other seminar right there, right? But, I mean, you understand, like, that's a huge challenge for them. So, they're coming to school, and they've got these, I mean, I'm just putting two massive boulders up there, right? We got two. I, I, sorry, I almost got nervous because a lot of people are standing up. Oh, they're leaving. No, they're just all standing up. I know, three hours of sitting. Believe me, I'm glad I'm up here. Um, so, they've got these massive, I mean, it looks something like this. I mean, if you can put an, an analogy to it, right? You've got a student and this is their task. They arrive, and even if they were valedictorian at their school, and you know if you've been teaching at the community colleges, that we do often get some of the very top students, but for reasons outside of their control, they can't get into a four-year school. Something happens along the way, right? And even they have this massive undertaking to do. It's a struggle, for sure. So, may not be getting help. <laughs> Who's gonna help them? Right? We're, that's what we're here for, right? We're here to help them. What I'm uh, going to suggest to you today is sort of a, a mindset of how we go about doing that, okay? I thought that was cool. That might have got, got, got like a, oh, nice colors, but no, okay. You're going to be like that. It's all right. It's going to be like that. So my idea is, is really to have this mindset of, of, you know, embracing service and learning. And so I want to talk about those two things for just a little bit, if you don't mind. The first one is service. Now, actually, when I travel around, um, let me see if I can do this, anywhere I go, I, um, and when I teach every day even, uh, those of you who, I, actually, I think somebody out here knows me from Three Rose College, uh, I don't wear a, uh, my jacket ever. So I'm going to take this off for a second. What I actually wear, I just started doing this a few years ago. 
I'll move that up. Don't worry in the back there. How's that? Tasting. One, two, three. Okay. So I, I actually, this is more what, what I look like. I know it's really good, right, Babylicious? I look good. Yeah. <laughs> I dress like this all the time. Okay. And so when I go to conferences and I present, I do other things, I dress like this. I don't wear the suit all the time or if I'm walking around. And here's what started happening a few years ago when I started doing this is I would go and uh, maybe my presentation is tomorrow or tonight or something like that. And you know how in conferences they have like the, at the good ones, like they have the buffets and stuff and, <laughs> or the, you know, the breakfast burrito, whatever. You have, the, you have a, a hangout spot, right? And you're doing stuff. Well, you know, so I would go, I would go there and I have my tag on, you know, I have all my required stuff so that uh, the police don't come and get me. And I'm hanging out in line doing whatever and somebody will come up with me, up to me. I remember the first time clearly and they come up to me. Excuse me, but you're out of ketchup. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. The first couple times that happened, I was a little bit offended. Now, a little bit, you know, I didn't say anything, but I'm like, oh, really? Um, let me go find somebody for you. Let me see if I can, and then, you know, and then when they catch the tag, they get all red and like, oh, I'm so sorry. And then, and then they see me up on stage the next day and they're just like, <laughs> But here's the thing, here's, here's what happened. It, I, literally, it still happens to this day, no matter where I go. In fact, when I went outside today, I was eating breakfast with you guys, you probably didn't notice, because I had my jacket on. But <laughs> I bet if I had my vest on, just like this, somebody would have said, hey, do you have any more of those chorizo burritos? You know? <laughs> and you know what I would have said? Let me go find some for you. Because what I discovered after a while is I needed to think differently about what I was doing. Not what they were doing, but I was getting offended for no good reason at all. They thought I was somebody that could help them out. And so I embraced the whole idea of serving others. It, it, and it was that small of an incident that got me thinking, serving others, this is really respectable to be able to serve. You know, how great is that to be able to serve your colleagues, your friends, your family, your students, anybody who needs help? So why don't I go ahead and do that? So now literally, I'll, same thing happens, and I'll go in there, hey, you guys are out of eggs. I'll be like, okay, um, let me see what I can do about that. And I'll go to somebody who works in the hotel or the conference center and say, I think you guys are out of eggs. Or they'll say, do you know where the bathrooms are? Or where, and actually they don't say, do you know? They say, where are the bathrooms? <laughs> and I'm like, um, you know, I think I saw some down the hall over there, right over there. And then the, when I say it like that, they're like, they look at me. What do you mean you think you saw? Don't you work here? <laughs> and uh, so this whole mindset of serving others, just being willing to be of service, of help. And in fact, you know what was interesting? I had a, a really um, intense conversation with our faculty senate on campus last semester. And a couple times I mentioned to them, I'm, you know, I'm honored to be able to serve you in any capacity. And at one point, somebody raised their hand and said, you know, David, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable that you feel you have to serve us. And I said, hold on, let me clarify myself. I hope that all of us would be willing to serve each other in some capacity. Funny thing, a month later, our president was talking about stuff, and all of a sudden the word service started coming up. Uh, VP was making an announcement, service started coming up. And just the idea that we are willing to serve each other. So that's what I mean by service, uh, and being in the mindset of that. So lifelong learning. Well, it's okay, so we're in a, in a college, we're in an institution of, of learning, and so we, as, of course, assume, the assumption is, the students are here to learn, right? Of course. And uh, we hope that they become lifelong learners, that they just embrace this whole experience and just love the idea of learning new things and being better, becoming better, being somebody more than they are now, and, and that's what we're hoping for them, right? That would be the best, wouldn't it? What if every one of our students left with that mindset? That would be amazing, right? Do we think of that for ourselves? That's what I ask you. As faculty, do we want to be alive? Do we want to model what we want our students to become? What about not just the faculty, but what about the classified? Do we do the same thing? Do we all think, so now it's getting a little more personal, right? Do we all think as lifelong learners? What about our administrators? Do they consider themselves lifelong learning? They may not have all the answers but they're willing to keep learning and get better at what they do, already knowing that they're quite proficient at their job, right? 
How about just all of us in general? What if you're a parent? Right? And that's an easy one, isn't it? Because, I mean, I've got, I got four kids. But, you, know, you know, there's no manual out there. Right? You, if you stop learning, that game over. <laughs> you're done. Right? So grabbing all of us together and just having this idea of embracing the growth and the process, not the end product, because we don't know what the end product is going to be for our students or for ourselves. We just don't know what that end is. I, to me, I think I'd get bored the moment I figured out, holy smokes, I'm at the end. Wait, that means I'm dead. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> That's not good. Now, here's just some ideas on, on learning. You know, could we learn some of these things? I think we could, because imagine, like, I mean, apply it to your students for a second. Would you love to have students that walked out of your classroom with some of these traits? That they had learned some of these in your classroom or here at Valley College through their experience in your classes or through campus life or student government or just having bumped into you in the counseling office or financial aid office or EOPS office uh, through their entire stay here? It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? I want to take one of these just so I can show you an example of what I mean uh, in terms of the learning process. So I'll take patience because that's a good one. So um, especially our front, our front staff, right, our front people who work in the offices where you see students come in, sometimes before they're even students, you get like the same questions all day long, every day, every semester, never ending, right? How many of you, and I'll be honest, Look away so you don't fire anybody. How many? No, I'm just kidding. How many of you come in and have not had a good day with that? Whether you're teaching or whether you're a front office or anything, not had a good day in terms of an experience with a student. Raise your hand if you've ever had something like that. I'm, I'm going to tell you right here. I know I've had not good days. Okay. The rest of you are perfect. Good. No, <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Raise your hand one more time, nice and high. I just want to see who's lying. No, no. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Okay. It's hard, right? But what if you decided to embrace this whole idea? If you made a conscious decision and said, hey, okay, I'm going, I'm going into Valley now. I'm going to take a deep breath. And I'm going to think for a second about the opportunities I have today. What will I learn today? How will I help somebody today? How will I serve them today? Not knowing what kind of day they're having, but knowing that actually you might be the person that changes their entire life without ever knowing it. Think about that as we come into work together, because that's impactful. Okay? So, some days you're not going to have that patience, right? You don't learn it one day, and then, okay, I've learned patience. Cool. Let me check that off my list. I'm done. It doesn't work that way. In fact, what I want to show you is I want to do a little demo here. Music is a great way to, to show how this process works. So let me play something for you, if you don't mind, a little something. I'm going to see if I can do it like this. There we go. Ready? I know you're saying he's crazy. Oh, you're good. Okay, you turned off my mic. Okay, that's a good idea because it's going to spit in. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, just let me say that those of you who clapped, you need to raise your standards, <laughs> all right? That was horrible. Can we be honest about that? That was terrible. But you know what? That's what I sounded like in fourth grade, okay? So how do we go from that to this? Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, that was it. Too bad. Thank you very much. <laughs> How do we get from one to the other? That's pretty obvious, right? I practiced a lot. All right. Now, if my son was here, who also plays trumpet, he's about to go to college too. He's a senior. He would agree with me that even though that was pretty good, I mean, that, okay, that was good. <laughs> but could it be better? Yes, it could be better. So this skill that I'm working on, this practicing the trumpet in this case, this practicing patience, this practicing these other, any of those other traits that you saw up there, is ongoing. It's never ending. You're going to get to the point when you're feeling pretty confident about it, and hopefully you embrace the notion that you know there's no end to that, that you can keep learning through different experiences, de uh, dedication. So I could hit a whole other level of that, right? In fact, if I hit that whole other level, I probably would be a performer. I just don't like to perform. That's a lie. Okay. So <laughs> that's, that's an, uh, I think, hopefully that makes it really clear how that works. So what other things could you learn? I mean, the other stuff had really more to do with learning dispositions. Let's be a little more practical now, more pragmatic. Take a look at that list, okay? These are some of the things that happen right here at Valley. Uh, your president mentioned, uh, Diana mentioned the, the OER is a, big, is a big initiative right now. Yeah, that's huge. Canvas, I know it's getting rolled out right here. At Cerritos, we just had it rolled out last year. We've been through that whole process. Yeah, that's huge. But there's these other things too. Some of you have been teaching for a long time, and there might be something on this list that you have never looked at. Would you be willing to get better at these, to learn more about these, to get involved on your campus with one of these? Because imagine if you all did, just picked one here, something new, something different, or something that you know a little already something about, but you want to get to the next level. You want to get to the point where it's more ingrained into your everyday psyche so that when a student comes up to you and talks to you about something, you're really um, versed on, for instance, Starfish. That's a program that's unique to your, to your college, right? Or the Big Bear program, unique to your college, okay? ADA compliance. So looking at that list. Now, I'll go back to this question of why, like why why put this much effort into it? Why decide to, to grab this growth mindset? And I'm going to relay it this way in, uh, to a personal story for me. How many of you remember this picture? How many of you saw it happen on video? Okay. So not everybody in the room even knows this picture anymore. This is a picture that was taken in 1986. Okay. The Challenger. Uh, some of you, uh, probably almost everybody has read about it at this point, is whether or not it has any significance to you. This has a lot of significance to me. In 1986, they put the Challenger, it was going to go up in orbit, and it had a crew, and it was, I think it was the most diverse crew they'd ever had at that point. They even had a teacher on there, Christy McAuliffe. Okay? Didn't make it to orbit. It blew up. Okay, while that was happening, I was uh, attending college. I was in my very first year of college. And I, again, remember I was part of the 50%. I was also part of that percentage of students whose parents said, oh, you wanna do that? Good luck. By that meaning, I had been uh, offered a full ride to Northern Arizona University as a music major. My uh, grandfather, who was like on a pedestal as high as you could put him in my eyes, had gotten me into the Anna Annapolis Academy. To this day, I don't know how he did that. I have, I have no idea. I wasn't that smart. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he got me in, and literally I had to walk into his bedroom the night before I was going to sign the papers and say, Dad, I, I can't do that. I, it, it, I, I just can't. That's not my path. And it was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do to break his heart, because I knew I broke his heart. And because he was who he was, he said, okay, mijo, tell me what you want to do. My mom said, fine, see you later. And that, they, literally, they cut me off, because we were in that, that sort of, you know, our culture. 
So the mom says do this, that's what the dad's going to do with the mom, and it's done. So I got cut off, literally, on that, from that point on. You're on your own. Figure out how you can do college. All that to say that by the time in 1987, when I was getting ready to finish my second year of college, I was majorly stressed out. I had received financial aid. I had received scholarships. But it was only enough for two years. I, and I was on a five-year program. I was a dual major at that, at that point. And uh, I was stressing out because I knew I only had enough money for two years. Like it was going to run out. And I had no idea what I was going to do. None whatsoever. And I had gone to the financial aid office, like I think, I, I want to say every day, but I know it wasn't every day. It felt like that, though. And the stress of everything, you know, here I am trying to study and be successful, but always in the back of my mind was, how am I going to finish what I started? Because I remembered clearly the conversation I had with my grandmother when she told me that we were done. Because I was getting a haircut, she used to cut my hair, and I'm sitting in a chair and she's saying, how are you going to do it? And I said, don't worry about it, I'm going to do it. How are you going to do it? Don't worry about it, I'm going to do it. You're not going to do it, how are you going to do it? Don't worry about it, I'm going to do it. You're not going to do it, how are you going to do it? I'm done. I didn't talk to her for that, uh, after that for a while. And now I was at that point where it's like, I'm thinking, is she right? I don't think she's right. Right here, I'm feeling it. I, she's not right. I can do this. I just, I just don't know how I'm going to do it yet. I've explored every option. I'm walking down the halls at the college one day. It's about midway through the spring semester. And one of the counselors that I knew, her name was Susan. I remember her first name, and I wish I knew her last name. Her name was Susan, and she says, David, hey, hey, I'm glad I saw you today. There's this new grant that's coming out. I want you to apply for it. And I'm like, OK. I applied for it. I got it. First time it'd been out. What it did was paid all my tuition for my last two years of, of college. Paid everything for me. And I was an RA, because I'd figured out that I could get free housing for being an RA, so that meant I had to be a nice person all of a sudden. <laughs> so I did that too. I did anything I could. I, I cleaned trumpets when I was in college to make money. But that literally saved me and changed my entire life. You know what that grant was called? The Christy McAuliffe Grant. I had no idea. I just knew it was money. And it wasn't until years later, when I got just a little older and a little wiser, that I could look back and go, holy smokes, like, how did that happen to me? I don't know how. And you know what? The, the real tragedy for me was in that, I never got to thank Susan. She doesn't know. She doesn't know that she changed my life. I wish I could thank her, but I can't. So I'd like to thank you. All right. I want to thank you for making a difference. Because of whether you know it or not, you're making a difference every day. Remember that. So now we take a student who started here with us, and that's most students. Most students feel like this. But now we're thinking about service and lifelong learning. And so they've got some support now. But the thing is, it's not just the one student. I mean, you're dealing with entire classes, right? Especially if you're a teacher, you're dealing with entire classes. And in fact, if we're all embracing this, then our community is involved too, right? They have your whole support system. All of you are involved here. And if that's the case, we might be able to grab a single moment in a day when that happens. One moment, like it happened for me. But that's not the case either. 
you go through entire semesters doing this, day in and day out, entire semesters. And we already know because of that graph that I showed you at the very beginning, that this doesn't happen just in this moment. It affects the future. You're affecting and you're changing and you're impacting the future every day. So this is what we get now. This is what you're doing with the students now. This kind of thing. So I want you to take a look at this list one more time. And do me a favor. If you see something on this list that you would like to learn about, that you're interested in, that you're willing to commit to learn a little bit more about, to learn more, and while I say that, Notice there's an other right here. So what you're really committing to is lifelong learning. But is there something on there on the board? If there is, can you do me a favor? Can you stand up if you see something on the board that you're willing, or maybe you're already involved. If you're already involved, can you stand, just stand up. I'm not going to ask you to talk, don't worry. Is there something on here that you're willing to commit to? One item is all we need. Or maybe you're already committed to that item. Okay. And if you're already committed to the items, go ahead and stand up. Maybe you already advocate for it. Maybe you already lead it. Or you know nothing about something that's on there, and yet you're thinking, hmm, I'm going to find out what that is. OK, I'm going to take a picture now, because so, this is your contract. No, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just saying, look around you. This is the team that's going to change lives, has already changed lives will continue to change lives, and will continue to change now and the future for your students. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. I know I'm going to talk to the faculty again a little bit more, and I'm happy to talk with you after we're done here. So thank you very much.